So, um, well, we have, uh, we're conscious that we stand between this panel, uh, between us and lunch. So we have about 10 minutes Ricky has given us uh, to have some conversation among our three. Well, Enrique left, so actually this will be much shorter. Um, to have some conversation, I, I, uh, we probably have time just to explore a couple of things. Uh, one, we want to talk, um, Omer, specifically about what all this means for, for Istanbul in a second, but uh, just try to make a, maybe connect these, uh, these three ideas, these three sort of themes that have come out and see where the disconnections are. I mean, first of all, just to put it in summary, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Enrique, you talked about, first of all, I think you started the sort of, how do we reconcile on the one hand the primacy of the market forces, which what you talked about, which is how strong that is and the tension between the market forces on the one hand and this notion of the city and, and who's in charge and how decisions are made, but that there is a very strong, that the market left on its own in your proposition will not necessarily produce a great city for its people. With that, go to Alejandro, your point, which is how cheapness right, has become, in a way, the shaper of cities, and that cheapness is a driving force in the shape of cities. It was part of your proposition, and in some ways, the way that's uh, uh, pushing cities to a particular place. Um, and then, of course, Richard talked about what is, in a way, the, what is the ideal form? What is what cities should strive for? The compact city, urban form, equality, sustainability, as what we should be striving for. So, in a sense, how do we reconcile, I mean, not that they can be reconciled, but how do you, your thoughts on these tensions between market, between cheapness and consumption, between where we should be in terms of the compact city, Connecting, I think, uh, you know, Richard talked about how architecture and planning, the vertical and the horizontal are one, cannot be thought of separately. And of course, adding to that, the political, so architecture, planning, and politics really have to all be connected to produce this. Um, and I was struck yesterday thinking about, uh, in your, your, your uh, presentation, Alejandro, about yesterday, Suketo Meta made the point about um, as he was looking, as we've traveled around in the urban age, the different cities, and you almost feel when you see how Mumbai is developing and you see the towers that you showed, what's happening in Istanbul, you can see it in Shanghai, and asked, is there one architect for all of this? Is there someone who's just literally sitting there, did one design, put it out over the computer, went out, and the cities, these instant cities that are driven by cheapness, driven by market, driven by politics, are producing a form that's ultimately unsustainable. So a long preamble, but maybe we can get to the point here of what is the role of the architect, urban designer, planner? How do we try to bring these contradictions? What's the voice? How do we shape this? I think we know what the problem is. We know what the challenge is. What's the best way we intervene to get to what, what Richard showed us in, in terms of mobilizing the politics that it connects with our planning and connects with our architecture to produce more sustainable cities? Maybe I'll just open it up to your thoughts, and then I think we can go to how that plays out in Istanbul. Maybe I can add a remark. Or anyone, that, I mean, or Enrique, I'm sure you have a thought about how this. Just to provoke some thoughts, I mean, starting from the point there, uh, Alejandro left. I mean, I don't remember who said that, but I mean, uh, there was a question which is addressed to a socialist thinker. I mean, what do you think about McDonald's or Coke? I mean, he said that uh, they are perfect because, I mean, uh, Obama can drink the same quality of Coke with the uh, person who is living in Vietnam in the street. And so there is a, I mean, starting from your point of cheapness and quality, I mean, it, uh, if we can uh, reduce or create a new way of, I mean, delivering architecture with the same standard to everyone accessible, I mean, uh, then we can maybe introduce uh, democracy and equalization by, way, by means of architecture. So, and uh, Richard also uh, speak about, spoke about the density and how we need density in, in, in the cities. And actually, when we talk about how politicians should also develop these kinds of densities, I mean, they have to be convinced in order to, cre uh, to create uh, uh, laws to create these kinds of densities. Actually, density, uh, I think, uh, something the politicians need because, I mean, 
when you decentralize the cities and also decentralize the country, then it's harder for the politicians to address their, I mean, people. And so they are going to collect votes from those cities. And I mean, the, the more dense, the more easier for politicians. So maybe we should speak from the language of the politicians when we speak about also creating cities and designing cities. So, let me ask you. Just no. I don't think that there is any contradiction in, uh, between the three proposals. It's just we are talking from different yeah. uh, different perspectives, and, and I am in no way opposing uh, intervention. I, I think intervention is obviously necessary, and I think that uh, uh, I, I completely share uh, Richard's uh, uh, strategies in order to, to make cities more sustainable. The, the reason why I'm, I'm putting forward these uh, uh, bad examples, perhaps, of uh, unsustainable uh, urban uh, development um, and try to make something out of it is because I, I believe that despite the, their problems, uh, these developments are doing one thing, which is to democratize the access to the city. Uh, I think that the developments that, uh, for example, uh, Richard is, uh, is uh, proposing, or the type of growth that, that, that Richard is, is, is proposing is obviously <clears throat> ideal, but probably not always affordable in, in, in the current market economy. And that, that's where uh, probably certain level of intervention is required in, or, in order to make, uh, to make these uh, things uh, affordable. So I, I'm, I'm just uh, suggesting that rather than uh, entirely dismissing this uh, uh, type of urban growth as unsustainable and uh, non-civic, uh, perhaps if we turn them one point more, if we intensify them, we can, we can uh, perhaps produce something that will start challenging the status quo that uh, Enrique is... Uh, I think but, uh, Richard. Enrique, Enrique uses my Bible. I, will, I use his Bible. Too. And, I have, <laughs> and I have very little to say about what Enrique says. I think at the basis of all this is that private greed is eroding public responsibility. And this is the big balance. Funnily enough, I don't think it's about cost. Um, I think you can cut down cost. It's easier if you have money. It's about distribution of wealth. That's another discussion. Mm. Um, and I clearly, it's, the distribution of wealth is a very complex. There's a very good book that's just come out called The Spirit Level, if anybody's read it, but it shows the health implications of that distribution of, we of wealth, as well as the urban implica implications. Um, cost is a complicated thing, because of course, just to take the point, Alexander, you said about um, Mies van der Rohe, Mies van der Rohe, with or without bronze, is I'm going to say expensive architect. If you do it in that way, you know, it's not, he's not, he's not a sort of a four by two bits of tile architect. He gives you a certain value. A certain value. Um, I think basically that we need to understand what, the, what we want. Right? Long term value is very different to short term va value. Most of the things that we have seen, which are, are low cost, which are important to have low cost, have short term. Mm -hmm built into them. So what is the, uh, what is the, the problems with wealth? What are the problems with poverty? How do you distribute that, that wealth? To me, that is a critical part of, of where we have to go. But most important of all that is what we're seeing is we do have a pretty much an agreement about where we're going. There will be variation. Mm. There are clearly national and regional variations. But I suspect that everybody is more or less saying the same thing. Which is pretty amazing today. Do you, well, the, just to pick up on that, I mean, Omar, do you do you think that's right in the context of Istanbul? I mean, in the sense of the, the debates that are happening about the growth and the form of Istanbul, and what you're saying in terms of the the sense of we 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 have an idea about what makes cities work. Uh, there's a the, the the kind of form of cities, the connection of land use and transport. We heard this morning in panels that there seems to be a disconnect between transportation and land use policy. How is all this playing out here? And what, do the architects have a voice? Are the planners having a voice? How are, how are those views integrated into this debate? 
Are they? Um, actually, unfortunately, I don't think there is a, I mean, a overall, overall voice which is, I mean, addressed by architects or planners altogether because. And is there, is there, is there agreement? I mean, the, I think the there is an agreement which is not spoken yet. I mean, but uh, I, but um, let me rephrase it like that. I mean, uh, the sustainability uh, become became a buzzword for most of the architects, and it's now being used mostly like a slogan instead of I mean, uh, uh, the content of the sustainability has been emptied mostly for the last couple of years, especially in the architectural scene. And now uh, it's being used like a label for the buildings, especially by the property developers. I mean, even we don't, for example, have a, a tax reduction for any kind of uh, uh, certificates like BREEAM or LEED here in Turkey. Now the, I heard that uh, some private developers would like to apply for these kinds of certificates just for, I mean, branding there and increasing the market value of their properties. I mean. It's, there is no use for uh, tax reduction for them, and uh, they don't actually care about the environment. I mean, so uh, the whole production of architecture, I mean, is almost reduced into a kind of uh, producing capital. I mean, and especially with the last couple of years, I mean, uh, I see that uh, the square meter is becoming a new currency. And especially in our world, but uh, it's very dense here in Istanbul. And so the, uh, the government also sees that uh, the land pieces, the square meters are actual currencies and to cover up the budget holes. And so they are privatizing the government lands, uh, which we always talk about that. I mean, it should be avoided, but uh, actually the government doesn't think like that. I mean, so, uh, uh, and Within all those, I mean, environment, uh, I think uh, sustainability is always, I mean, reduced into a slogan. I mean, we cannot think about or speak about the real content of the sustainable building or the sustainable city, as we talked here I mean, among architects. And I, I still keep and hope that, I mean, in the future it is going to be more, I mean, uh, debated and uh, the real actual, I mean, sustainable buildings should be, I mean, Develop and designed uh, by a more uh, consciousness, I suppose, by architects. Enrique, and, and what did since we have to go in about a, a minute? Uh, a minute. <laughs> I see Ricky over here uh, signaling. Uh, uh, but, but, um, but go ahead, Enrique. And then what did, what advice do you have? I mean, it's you talked about political courage. You talked about your your story. You you've had some observations. You're traveling all over the world. Where do you where do you start? Well, first, I was the most valuable resource a city has is its street space. It's like a treasury. If they found diamonds or, or oil under Istanbul, it would not be as valuable. This is really the treasure. Uh, and uh, the most difficult political issue is how to distribute this space between pedestrians, well, bicycles, not so much here, uh, public transport, and cars. It's, but these things have to be discussed. I mean, if you ask, if you find somebody in the street and you ask them what their ideal home is, I am sure they have exactly in mind what their ideal home would be, in which neighborhood, uh, in which house high, in what story, uh, whether it would have a balcony, what color it would be, the walls, everything. But if you ask them what their ideal city would be, most of the time maybe they have not thought much about it, how to mix commercial and residential or how high the buildings or how wide the sidewalks. I, I, I would propose that you have a, a planning machine, a planning machine for the city. I, 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 Richard Rogers said that maybe when Paris is more important than the grand plans, with a thousand of, thousands of small projects so as to make more humane or better different environments. I will have a, a, a planning machine, which is a, 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 a three-seat wheel, three wheelchair with a small electric engine, and you would, uh, with a chain, with a lock, you would uh, put there the mayor and the head of planning, perhaps, <laughs> and in the middle, this the youngest child of either two, and then push them and take them to go around the city to see how well they do, you know? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, maybe on that note, 
I think, well, there's a lot more we could explore, but it's hard to go past that. Unless anyone, Richard or anyone, has another comment, I'll thank everybody. Uh, thank you, Omar. We'll pick up on Istanbul later.